talk about the completeness of RK. Uh, remember that uh, the k-dimensional uh, Euclidean space is equipped with the Euclidean distance, which we have already introduced. And uh, what we want to show is that that metric space is in fact complete. In other words, that uh, every Cauchy sequence in this metric space is necessarily convergent. Okay, so now since uh, we will be talking about sequences in RK, we have a bit of a notational problem because we have been using subscripts to identify the index within a sequence and also the index within a vector, right? So we can't use the subscript for both. So here is what I'm going to do. Uh, so this is just notation. Right? So this is a local not, uh, notation, right? because we won't often be talking about sequences uh, of elements in RK. So only for this uh, video, we will follow the following convention. So given a sequence uh, Xn in RK, I will denote by Xn bracket I uh, this will be the ith component of xn. Okay, where xn, remember, is a k-dimensional vector of reals, right? So, the notation I will follow as consistently as I can in this video is that the subscript will correspond to the sequence index whereas if I want to refer to the uh, ith component of that particular element I'll just write that as bracket i so neither in the subscript nor in the superscript okay so this is the notation we are going to follow with this notation uh, we start off with the following lemma Right, so this lemma has two statements. The first of these is as follows. The first statement tells you that a sequence xn in RK, what that means is that every element of xn is in fact a k-dimensional vector of reals. Right? A sequence xn in RK converges if and only if, uh, if I restrict myself to any component j of the sequence, then the sequence of reals xn of j converges. So remember, this is a sequence of reals. Right? And we already know what it means for that sequence to converge. So uh, essentially what the first statement tells you is that a sequence of uh, elements in RK converge if and only if the sequence corresponding to every component converges. Right? So this is the first statement. We'll then make a similar statement in the same lemma about Cauchy-ness. Uh, a sequence Xn in RK is Cauchy if and only if every component sequence is Cauchy for each uh, j which is 1, 2 all the way up to k uh, the sequence x, n, j remember once again this is a real sequence is Cauchy Okay, so uh, a sequence in RK is convergent if every component sequence is convergent. A, se a sequence in RK is Cauchy if and only if every component sequence of reals is Cauchy. Okay, so that is what uh, the statement, uh, the statement of this lemma conveys. Okay, so there are, as you can see, there are two statements in this. It turns out that the proof of statement two is very analogous to the proof of statement one. So I'm going to leave the proof of uh, of statement one as an exercise because it's going to follow along similar lines we focus on proving statement two
right? That's this one. It says that uh, a sequence in our case, Cauchy if and only if every component sequence is, uh, uh, every component sequence associated with the original sequence is also Cauchy, okay? Uh, so this in turn is going to uh, rely on the following statement. Uh, for let's say x and y in our k, the following is true. xj, the jth component minus yj, the absolute value of this is less than or equal to the Euclidean distance between x and y okay I leave it this is a this just follows from the definition of dk go back stare at the definition and convince yourself that in fact uh, the euclidean distance between x and y exceeds the one dimensional you know distance between the corresponding jth components of x and y okay and further this can be upper bounded by square root k times the maximum of the basically one dimensional distances between the components. So max over all i from 1 through k of uh, xi minus yi. Okay, so, uh, so this is again easy to show. Okay, follows easily from the definition of dk itself. So this is the property that we are going to use in order to prove that in fact uh, a sequence in X, uh, Xn is Cauchy if and only if every component of that sequence is Cauchy. Okay, so let's look at one part of that. Suppose that Xn is Cauchy. What does that mean? Uh, given epsilon greater than zero, there exists n naught such that uh, for all m n greater than n naught, you have that the distance between x m and x n must be less than epsilon. However, from the first of the two inequalities that we have written above, if dk of xm comma xn is less than epsilon, so is absolute value of the difference between the jth components of these two, which implies that again for all m n greater than n naught, uh, xm of j minus xn of j is also less than epsilon which in turn implies that if you look at the sequence x and j, this is a one dimensional Cauchy sequence. Okay, so using the first of the two inequalities, it's very easy to see that if the sequence xn is Cauchy, then the jth component of that sequence, which is a sequence of reals, is also Cauchy. Okay, so now what remains is to show the other side. Now, suppose that x n uh, j is Cauchy for all j. Okay, now we need to prove that x n, which is the sequence in R k itself, is Cauchy. Okay, so now uh, given epsilon greater than zero, there exists. Uh, let's say, let me even not use n naught, let me say nj such that uh, mn greater than nj implies that absolute value of xmj minus xn of j is less than, well, except I'm going to define it as epsilon by root k. Okay, I kind of got scrunched a little bit, but I hope it's clear. Uh, given that xnj is Cauchy, uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an nj such that if m and n exceed nj, 
then the distance between xmj and xnj right the jth component uh, the sequence along the jth component is less than epsilon by root k right i can always define uh, for any epsilon i can set epsilon by root k as the threshold and uh, you know as the error threshold and get the corresponding threshold capital nj from the cosiness of xnj okay now we do the familiar uh, business uh, let uh, n be the max of these nj's right and then use the second of these inequalities namely that dk of x comma y is less than or equal to square root k times the largest of uh, xi minus yi to conclude the following for m and n greater than n in fact uh, dk of x n comma y n must be less than or equal to square root k times the max right but each of those elements is less than uh, maybe i'll write the next step as well so square root k times the max of absolute value of x n i minus x m i right so this max is over 1 less than equal to i less than equal to k but each of these differences is going to be less than epsilon by root k so which means this entire thing will be less than epsilon right and that completes the argument right because then we have shown that in fact uh, xn is itself Cauchy because given epsilon greater than 0 I have in fact demonstrated the existence of a threshold capital N such that for all m n larger than n dk of the distance between the k dimensional Euclidean distance between xn and x m I should say yeah uh, is less than epsilon okay so this essentially, yeah, it all really boils down to the use of this one inequality, right? This is essentially all we have used to show that cosiness of the sequence uh, is equivalent to the cosh, you know, in the k-dimensional space is equivalent to the cosiness of every component, right? And the same style of argument would also let you prove statement one, which is that the convergence of the sequence in RK is equivalent to the convergence of each component of that sequence in R. Okay, so this was a preliminary lemma that we needed in order to address the completeness of RK, which we will now do in the next theorem. Right? So when I say Euclidean space RK, I implicitly mean the metric space where uh, DK in fact defines the distance. Okay, uh, so let's see. This in fact now follows quite easily from the previous lemma that we have shown. Okay, now what do we need to prove in order to prove that uh, RK is complete? I need to argue that every Cauchy sequence in RK is also convergent. In other words, for every Cauchy sequence, there must exist an element of RK that the sequence in fact converges to. Right? So consider Cauchy sequence Xn in RK. Okay? So by previous lemma, the sequence xnj also is Cauchy in R and this is in particular true for any j right however since we know that R is in fact complete it follows that there exists some number let's call it xj in R such that xn of j in fact converges to x of j right so because we know that r is complete so which means Cauchy sequences in r are in fact convergent so remember 
that yeah when i say cauchy in r i mean with the dif distance metric defined on r right the standard distance metric that in turn implies that there must exist some xj such that xj is in fact the limit of x and j okay uh, now we are done because now let x be composed of all of the components of these limits so x1 all the way up to xk hmm? now every component of my sequence converges right so again by the first statement of the previous lemma uh, xn in fact converges to x in rk right because every state every component sequence converges uh, the sequence in rk must also converge right also by previous lemma right so if you think about it uh, what the previous lemma that we proved let us do is basically piggyback on the completeness of r to prove the completeness of rk right so we just exploit so we go from cauchy sequences in rk to component cauchy sequences in r but in r the completeness of r implies that those cauchy sequences are in fact convergent so therefore there are limits for all of those component sequences and once there are limits for the component sequences the previous lemma tells you that uh, the sequence in rk which is obtained by composing those components together is also in fact convergent the limit simply being the the vector that you obtain by composing all of the one dimensional limits okay so this in turn shows that the euclidean space rk is in fact complete okay so there's one final thing that we will cover in this video and that is the bolzano weierstrass theorem in rk so remember the bolzano weierstrass theorem in r or bwt said that every convergent every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence right so we will basically make the same statement in rk now which is to say that every bounded sequence in rk in fact has a convergent subsequence yet for this i need to tell you what i mean by a bounded sequence uh, in rk uh, so a sequence let's say xn uh, sequence xn in rk is bounded uh if there exists some m greater than 0 such that the absolute value of every component is less than equal to m this is true uh for all j from 1 through k and for all n okay so in other words if 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 Uh, every component of your sequence is bounded then we say that the sequence in rk is also bounded okay so there are other ways of defining bounded uh, sequences in rk as well that are in fact equivalent but yeah let's not go there at this point uh, a sequence in r uh, in rk is bounded if every component is bounded essentially right and there is finitely many dimensions so you know if you have different bounds for each dimension or each component i could always take the largest of those and call that m okay uh, so having defined what it means for a sequence to be bounded in rk now let me state the bolzano weierstrass theorem every bounded sequence in rk has a convergent subsequence okay so uh, let us see how to go about proving this so the proof is actually going to be fairly straightforward so i'm just going to sketch it uh, quickly This is the proof of the 
Bolzano Maestro's theorem. So suppose you are given a bounded sequence xn in rk. Right? So the fact that the sequence in rk is bounded in fact, from the definition itself, implies that each of the one-dimensional component sequences x and j is also bounded. Okay, so that's it follows easily from the definition. So each of these converges, right? So uh, here is what I'm going to say, right? Now since the first component xn1 is a bounded sequence in R by the bolzano weierstrass theorem in 1D, we know that there exists a subsequence, a convergent subsequence of xn of 1. Okay, so by BWT, there exists a convergent subsequence of Okay, so let me just define, redefine xn such that it is this subsequence, right? I have just finally have to show that a subsequence of the original sequence exists, right? So for notational convenience, I'm just going to say that uh, I'm going to replace xn by this subsequence. Or maybe I could just say, uh, yeah, replace xn by this subsequence. This is so that I don't have to define nk. Okay, so I'm just going to redefine xn such that along this subsequence, the first dimension converges. Okay, so by restricting yourself to a subsequence of the original sequence, I have, I have gotten the first dimension xn1 to converge. Okay, now along this subsequence, I can find another subsequence where the second dimension converges, right? So by BWT, once again, there exists a convergent subsequence Okay, so I mean I'm abusing notation here, but what we are doing is basically saying that, okay, there is a certain subsequence of my original sequence along which the first dimension converges. Now focus on that subsequence. There is a subsequence of that subsequence along which the second dimension converges. Why? Because the second dimension is bounded, again by BWT, right? So now I have gotten myself a subsequence along which both the first and the second dimension converge. Both first and second dimension mm, converge along the subsequence. Right, so once again, replace xn by this subsequence just for notational convenience and now move on and come up with a subsequence of that where the third dimension converges and so on. right and so on right so finally you will end up with a subsequence along which all of the k components uh, converge in r and then go back to that first lemma that we proved in the or in the original in the in this in this lecture to argue that therefore along that subsequence in fact the overall sequence in rk must also converge right so finally you will end up with uh, you know basically a subsequence uh, let me just call it a sequence 
such that x and j uh, converges for all j which in turn implies that xn also converges again by first lemma right so we haven't tried to make the notation very consistent in this because yeah, it would just become unnecessarily messy but i hope the idea is fairly clear right so i first restrict myself to be as to along a sequence where the first dimension converges which i can by bwt then i restrict myself to a subsequence of that subsequence along which the second dimension converges so therefore along that subsequence of my first subsequence the first two dimensions converge right now you find a subsequence of that subsequence where the third dimension converges right so therefore along this subsequence of a subsequence of a subsequence the first three dimensions converge and i keep doing this till i land up with a subsequence along which all k dimensions converge and since all k dimensions converge separately in r the overall vector in rk must also converge this is in fact from the first lemma right where we tied the convergence of the sequence in rk to the convergence of the one dimensional component sequences right so that in turn lets you prove the bolzano weierstrass theorem okay so we'll stop here what we are going to go to next is use this notion of distance in abstract metric spaces to define uh, what are called open sets what are closed sets and other topological uh, properties